I preach in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Where are we today in the Old Testament reading? We're in a place called the Wilderness of Sin. From the book of Exodus today, we read, from the Wilderness of Sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages. The Wilderness of Sin. When we hear names of cities or deserts or rivers or place names of any kind in the Bible, these always, almost always mean something. The names hold meanings. They have something to say to us. The wilderness of sin is also called the desert of sin. It's important for us to know that it has no relationship whatsoever to the English word sin. It's merely the name of a region near Mount Sinai, Sin Sinai. But it sounds foreboding, and it is. Deserts in the scripture are almost always the locations for intense experiences, for the stark need for food or water, or a place of isolation and danger. And it's here today where the people of Israel start to throw their hands up in the air and rail against Moses. They've been wandering in this wilderness of sin in stages, the scripture says. So we can picture that they've been there for a long time. And now there's no water. Picture it, walking through a desert with no water for a long time. To try to get ourselves in touch with this, let's picture the stages that we have been through since March of this year when the pandemic reached us. We can do this, we said. We can shelter in place. We can stockpile supplies. We can close our doors, put our masks on, and hunker down. We can do this until May, we thought. Just a few months. And then through the summer, another stage. And now, six months in, and we're still scared and we're tired. So maybe we can relate to having no water for a long time. Maybe we can use this to relate to their frustration and their anger. The Bible says there was no water for the people to drink. And the people start grumbling and shouting at Moses, and they say, give us water to drink. And Moses says back to them, why, is, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Why? Why do we quarrel? Because we're drying up. How can you let, us happen, ha let this happen to us, God? There's no water in this wilderness of intensity and danger. So maybe we can relate. The people of Israel lose their tempers here. In their thirst and in their exhaustion, the Israelites say to their leader, and by extension to their God, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die of thirst? And then they demand, give us water to drink. It seems like Moses agrees with them. Why do you quarrel with me, he asks. And then he says, why do you, or in another translation, why don't you put the Lord to the test? In a fascinating commentary by biblical scholar Debbie Thomas, she points out that the people here aren't just praying. The Israelites aren't just praying to God or being cranky. This is legal language. They are taking their grievance to the next level. They aren't just complaining, they are lodging a formal complaint. They are placing God on trial. They're suing God. We're holding you accountable, God. We need you and begging the question, where are you when we need you the most? They're suing God. And that's not out of the realm of possibility, apparently. In 1970, a legal secretary from Arizona named Betty Penrose filed a lawsuit against God 
seeking $100,000 in damages for God's negligence for allowing a lightning bolt to strike her house. When God failed to turn up in court, the report says, she won the case by default. God didn't show up, so she won. It's a true story. Again, in 2007, Nebraska State Senator Ernie Chambers, who had served the state for 35 years, filed a lawsuit seeking an injunction against God for, quote, fearsome floods, egregious earthquakes, horrendous hurricanes, terrifying tornadoes, pestilential plagues, widespread spread death, destruction, and terrorization upon millions and millions of the Earth's inhabitants. This state senator actually did get the case before a judge, but the judge threw it out, not because he felt the case had no merits, but because God couldn't be properly served, the Associated Press wrote. Since God didn't have a legal address, the presiding judge argued that God can't be summoned to appear in court. So in the first case, God didn't show up, so the plaintiff won. And in the second case, God didn't show up, so the plaintiff lost. Either way, both are holding God responsible for what it is that they're facing. And while these instances of people suing God might sound absurd to us, what might be more relevant, more relatable, is the deeper question that both demand and it's a question we ask ourselves, and I've heard it over and over in the last few weeks. Where is God? Where is God when we need him the most? It's a question that a lot of us have been wrestling with as the pandemic continues, as the tensions around us rise, as the anxiety and the chaos in our country foment as relationships and patience and civility get stretched to the limits and our divisions are deepening. The story ends pretty quickly from there. Go out in front of the people God instructs Moses and take with you some of the elders and take in your hand the staff and go. In other words, gather the people, call the court to order, Call me as a witness to testify. Call me God, the witness, to testify, and I will be there in the stand, and I will be ready to answer. I will respond. Strike the rock, God says, and the water will come. And the water does come. And it's good for us to imagine those people who haven't had water in so long rushing for the quenching touch of it, for the, for the quenching drink of it, the release from what has kept them thirsting for so long. God will give us everything we need, guys. God will. Love will win. We won't perish. Our faith tells us that, and we can count on that. And as shallow and superficial as that sounds right now in the face of the very concrete hardships that we're facing right now, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it does bend towards justice. The water will come. We can believe that, or we can try to. I think what's really much harder to get our heads around right now is the question, do we really get to hold God accountable? Do we get to place God on trial? Do we get to express our rage at God? Do we get to tell God that we feel abandoned? Perhaps that answer can be found at the end of the story in some more place names. The scripture says, Moses called the place Masa, which means quarrels, and Meribah, which means tests because the Israelites did quarrel and because the people did test the Lord saying, are you among us or not? Friends, if you don't hear anything else that I'm saying to you today, I want you to hear this. If we are conditioned to believe that we cannot or should not 
bring our hard questions and even our grievances before God, then we are underestimating our relationship with God. God won't break and God won't smite us or punish us for our honesty or for our humanity. And we can take strength in knowing that the question why, why God, is the great spiritual question that is posed to God throughout all of the scriptures, by Moses and by Elijah and by all of the prophets, by the psalmists who ask, why is this happening? By Jonah who asks, why are you making me go there, God? Why are you making me do this? By Job, remember Job in the whirlwind, in a trial, where he asks God, why are you allowing this calamity to happen? And it's the question that is ultimately asked by our Lord on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is no shame. There is no blasphemy. And there is nothing that forbids us so should ever prevent us from bringing our anger, our grievances, even our rage in asking our deepest question of God, why? Where are you, God? Where are you when we need you the most? Give us water to drink. Is God among us or not? Yes. Where is God when we need him the most? Here. Is God still with us? The last line in the story asks, yes, all along always has been, whether we yell or not, whether we realize it or not, God will not punish us or abandon us for asking the question. So we might as well be honest in our prayers with God, whose very definition is, God's very definition is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, full of mercy. And we can ask it of our Christ, Emmanuel, who the very meaning of his name is God with us. I want to end with just a line from an exemplary prayer, a painfully honest prayer that was prayed last week by the noted preacher and blogger Nadia Boltz Weber. She prays, God, if you could show the heck up right now, That would be great. And if you are already showing up, give us new eyes to notice you. Amen.